The majority of the television shows that have attempted or merited parallels to Game of Thrones have imitated its genre norms. With the success of a blockbuster smash that proved mythology and maps weren't limited to fan conventions, fantasy and science fiction series have flourished in recent years, from The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power to Foundation. However, author George R. R. Martin drew inspiration for A Song of Ice and Fire, the HBO drama's source material, just as much from Middle-earth as from the actual battles that plagued England during the Wars of the Roses in the 15th century. Game of Thrones was based on historical events, including broken families, political alliances, and vast armies on foot, before dragons and ice zombies joined the picture. After six years of planning, two years of filming completed, and several weeks since the release of the highly anticipated Super Bowl commercial, Shogun has at last arrived on our screens with a generous two-episode launch. Based on James Clavell's 1975 dad book Shogun, not to disparage it, it's allegedly extremely good. This new adaptation of the famous story features a cast of top-notch Japanese actors who can really speak Japanese. It follows the Richard Chamberlain-led NBC miniseries that aired in 1980. Authenticity is key because of the involvement of one of these actors, the legendary Hiroyuki Sanada, who enthralls as Lord Yoshi Taranaga, as a producer, Michaela Clavel, Clavel's daughter, as an executive producer, and an apparently enormous budget to accurately capture historical and cultural details, and it's evident. Watching historical plays sometimes necessitate a significant amount of background knowledge, and let's be honest, Americans like me aren't often that knowledgeable about foreign political history. Before 1600, Japan had been dominated by an imperial court and a big boy emperor for generations. As the outlying provinces became more rich, feudal lords emerged, protected by samurai whose power began to threaten the emperors, and they were effectively in constant conflict with one another. The sovereign leader of this play, the shogun, came to power after, of course, a major samurai rebellion. After that, there was peace for a few centuries until another hundreds of years of unrest broke out. When the Taiko took power in 1590, he brought about a ten-year period of calm. When he passed away, he left behind a small child heir in the order to form a council of regents, also known as Basho. That's when our shogun comes into action. In fact, the first scene is Englishman John Blackthorne, the show's principal white guy, going about his business as a pilot on a Dutch merchant ship, coasting across a dark sea. He's the one who was the center of attention in the last TV version of Shogun. For the skipper and the crew, this journey has been unfavorable. While his commander has given up hope, Blackthorne is still hopeful that they will soon arrive in Japan, a country they have all heard about but haven't yet seen. He informs Blackthorne that their fleet has shrunk from five ships and 500 crew members to only one ship. Many of their crew members have perished from starvation. Not long after they had this chat, the captain actually takes his own life. When they get to land, samurai show up and search the ship, finding bodies all over the deck. At that point, the warriors discover their belongings, weapons, a few more almost dead men, and an enraged, prepared for battle Blackthorn who charges at them. They seize him and his companions right away because they are suspicious. None of these five Basho males are fond of one another in the meantime. However, Lord Taranaka is the one that the group majority despises the most. They believe he is up to some cunning crap which is why they have all convened at Osaka Castle. Not only has his fief expanded recently, but Lady Ochiba, the widow of the Taiko, has visited Taranaga's castle in Edo, and it is believed that he has kidnapped her as a show of strength. They don't believe him and decide to imprison him despite his claims that she is simply there to assist in the delivery of his grandchild, because her sister is giving birth, and they imply that in a short while, they'll probably vote to have him killed. This is how these first two episodes sort of lead in terms of exposition. They have two, after all. But it comes more from a character perspective. It's subtly and deftly weaved into the smooth fabric of the presentation. Now that we're getting into the details, here are a few more. Guess who Blackthorn despises because he is a European Protestant? The Catholics. Furthermore, Catholics from Spain and Portugal, especially the Portuguese, have made a significant impact on Japan at this time. In fact, they haven't even informed their Japanese hosts that there are other Europeans in the country. This was prior to Japan starting its own colonial endeavors in the late 19th century. They believed that where they were, everything were going well. However, as soon as Blackthorn meets with Taranaga, who is frantically trying to shore up authority in order to prevent his adversaries from killing him, 
he promptly reveals the strange transactions of his Portuguese enemies. Taranaga is furious to learn that his nation ostensibly belongs to Portugal. So why exactly is Blackthorn meeting with this hotshot lord? Since two of the other region's poshos are Catholics, Taranaga sees him as their enemy and knows he can use the Englishman as a political pawn. Taranaga believes that Totamerico, a Portuguese-speaking Catholic who converted, has the ability to translate so that he can speak with Blackthorn more directly and the priests won't meddle in their personal matters. As these two episodes come to a finish, Blackthorn, Mariko, and Taranaga have solidified their alliance. They will defeat the other regents together and possibly a few dubious priests as well. Taranaga won't sign the documents allowing the black ship to depart until they have had a chance to look into these bases because Blackthorn unloaded so much. The priest reports back to his team, who take offense at this. Following his permission for Blackthorn to remain in his chamber, we witness a lady make a futile effort to attack Taranaga, dying at his hands with Blackthorn's assistance. Taranaga discloses that the woman's target was Blackthorn rather than him, and he is aware of the identity of the assailant. Thus, there's a lot of mystery and room for devious drama here, and as I have indicated, there are a lot of interesting, historically correct details. The scenes are a feast for the senses, ranging from a verdant forest to musty, filthy dungeon cells to the massive timber palace with its central Kurosansui garden. The acting is superb. But friends with delicate hearts be warned, it gets graphic. In Shogun, the violence is intermittent but striking when it does appear. A man is boiled alive, characters go on throat-slashing rampages, men brandishing cadenas, chop off heads, and arrows pierce through people in the woods. If you must occasionally close your eyes, but let's all continue to observe. This is excellent content. The way this show depicts the realities of a language barrier, the individuals calling one other their equivalent of savages, and the levels of deceit that might result from depending on a person, possibly of dubious character, to translate are all fascinating aspects of the translation process overall. It adds more twist to the situation and effectively draws attention to cultural differences. By Western standards, this Blackthorn guy is pretty handsome. He has a rough singer-songwriter vibe. It turns out that Cosmo Jarvis is one. It's therefore amusing to observe how repulsed by his appearance the Japanese samurai and nobility he meets are, always referring to him as a dog. Stupid, mane-growing guy. In the globalized world of today, isn't it absurd to think that you don't even know that another place exists? It's possible that the Portuguese are dishonest in this way and pretend, by omission, that they are the only Europeans in the world crazy. A cultural disparity in hygiene at the time, and possibly even now, is highlighted in the final scene of episode 2. Blackthorn reacts frightened, two baths in a week, when Lady Mariko informs him that servants are getting ready to give him a bath. Do you want me to catch the flux or what? Dysentery is that. I did some research on it. We also get a moment in that sequence that I kind of like. Mariko hears Blackthorn say, your lord is in danger. In addition, I own a ship. Is he want to take her sailing with him? She responds calmly and collectedly telling him to bite his tongue and refer to her as Mariko-sama going forward. Yes, indeed. Be respectful to her. Mariko's hubby appears to be an enormous guy as well. He remarks, You laugh with our son like he's a lady of the court, when she makes jokes with her own child. It appears that she never laughs with this guy. Shogun offers the well-rendered action one would anticipate from a martial novel as the plot thickens. Instead of full-scale conflicts, though, the scale is reduced to things like two boats vying to escape a harbor or a lone warrior battling a gang of attackers. The show's attention in the interpersonal moments that can be lost in the din of battle is reflected in the tighter focus, which may also be an economic decision. A plot about two childhood friends on opposing sides of a power war and five candidates for an empty throne are superficial similarities to Game of Thrones. However, the emphasis on individuals that genuinely connects the two shows makes Shogun worthy of assuming the mantle of exhilaratingly immersive event television.